picking back up in the book of Ephesians, uh, we're going to be looking at the placement of sons, because previously, of course, we were talking about the fact that, and it is stated in Ephesians, that the author is Paul. Paul wrote this around 62 AD. Um, he then eulogizes the father, because remember the word blessed here actually means eulogize. Uh, oftentimes in English translations, the word blessed is, is two different words, which can cause a lot of confusion. We kind of went over that last week because one of them means to be happy and the other means to speak well of. So this one is to speak well of. God the Father has spoken well of. We also talked about the fact that he has marked us off beforehand, before the foundations of the world, in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4, 4 and 5 specifically. And it says, just as he has chosen us in him before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and blameless without him in love. So God chose that those who would be in Christ would be in a position to where, actually, as we go into the context here, they're going to be placed as sons. They're not going to be children, and we'll understand that here shortly as we go through it. He is not talking about being pre-chosen before the foundations of the world. And we, and like I said, last week we went over in some detail on that, and that's very important to understand. Because number one, it is not you individually that, that Paul is addressing here. Paul is actually, they're all plural. It's you all, all of you who are in Christ, not you as an individual, where people who want to teach that, you know, we're pre-elect will come here and say, well, you as an individual, you as an individual are not in the view here in, in the context. It's those who are in Christ that is in view. God decided before the foundations of the world, that he would take a group of believers and place them in Christ. And in placing them in Christ, they would have a special place of privilege before him. Just like he chose, he was going to select Israel, a nation. Did he have to have specifically the Israel that came out of Egypt to, to fulfill his promise? What did he say to Moses? I'll wipe them all out and I'll make a nation from you. Okay, so Israel can't go back and say, well, I'm individually chosen. No, that's not what God says as a nation. We don't want to be foolish in that sense. Plus, of course, other passages of Scripture that talk about this. We are um, reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to be blameless. And we talked about that a little bit over in Colossians, it refers to this. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 21 and 22, it says, And you who were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, or malignantly evil works, yet now he is reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. We've been marked off to be presented blameless before God the Father in Christ. He's the one who washes us so that we can be blameless. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 26 through 27. Now, again, this is talking about the church. That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish without spot this is what god has actually chosen for those who are marked off as ones who are in the body of christ now in verse five i'm going to deal with the word predestination here predestination that actual word doesn't occur in scripture and what i mean by that is you go back to the original language the, the original word for predestination doesn't occur in Scripture. This word doesn't mean to be predestined. Okay, and we're going to pull this word apart so we understand it. Okay, predestined uh, really only occurs in a translation, and it's a mistranslation of a particular word. So this word here actually comes from, it, it's, it's the word proharadzo which means, well, actually, you can kind of, you, you take the first part of it away. 
you can kind of hear it where it came across in English. Horizon. Horizon. Our actual English word horizon comes from this Greek word. You trace it right back to here. Now, this one has a preposition on the front, so it, it means to mark off beforehand, to make a horizon beforehand. That's actually this particular, that's what this word means. Now, we see it in other passages of Scripture, and I want to look at that, too. Uh, over in Acts chapter 4 and verse 28. And to do whatever your hands and your purpose, that is your determinate will, determined before would be done. Determined is the same word, proharizo. It's in a different form, so if you don't know Greek, it looks a little funny, but it, it comes from the same root. It means that you marked off beforehand that would happen. That also means that God the Father already knew exactly what was going to happen to Christ, and he set boundaries on what they could do. That's what it's talking about, and it's according to his determinate will. It is not saying which he predestined to happen. It's saying which he marked off. We also see it in relation to setting the boundaries of when the mystery of the, of the church and the salvation related to the church would be revealed. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden mystery which God ordained, no, which God marked off. Before marked off, because this is not your word ordained. Uh, we do have a perfectly good Greek word for ordained, by the way. This is a debt. This is actually a word to mark off. He marked off before the ages to his glory. The wisdom that Paul is talking about is being in Christ. God marked that off and said, I'm not going to reveal it until this time. And that's when he actually revealed it. Those were the boundaries set. This is when he's going to actually do it. So like I said, predestined is not actually um, supported in Scripture. It's a theological term that's imported into Scripture, and then people interpret Scripture based upon this term. And then you get kind of, well, every time you do that, you end up getting uh, sections of Scripture where they contradict other passages. It does not actually work. Um, there is actually another, by the way, when it comes to being elect, I want to back up just slightly. Um, well, actually, you guys don't have this in your notes. I have it in my review because um, I want to be reminded of a couple of passages here that are very important in understanding in relation to pre-elect. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. Now, this particular passage is a little difficult in our translations, but... Again, when we when we go back to the original and we hold to what it says, this passage is actually very clear. So here in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, it says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing. Now, your word willing here is actually your word boule. Boule means determinate will. So let's translate this correctly. Has not determined that certain ones would perish. God didn't determine that certain ones would perish. Now, if he did not determine certain ones to perish, how can we be predestined to salvation? Because he would then have to predestine people to destruction. It, it, it doesn't work without both sides simple as that but it says here in scripture he did not determine he did not make a determination that certain ones would perish but that all should come to a change of mind god gives all of us the opportunity to come to a change of mind he didn't pre-select anybody okay. that's one of the passages that's really important to understand 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4 is also another uh, one where it says, Who desires all men to be saved and to come to a full experiential knowledge of the truth. 
Now, if God only elected some, how could he then desire that all would come to the truth? That kind of contradicts the concept there. Now, I know there's people who want to, who want to claim pre-election, and they say all means the saved. Uh, no, in the context, that is not what it's saying. Okay. All, in this context, it's to be saved. Well, how are you saved? By coming to a full experiential knowledge of the truth. What is the truth he's talking about? Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. He was buried on the third day. That's proof that he actually physically died. He was, he was buried, and then he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. Just like scripture said. That's how we're actually saved. So you can't go back and you can't say, oh, well, God predetermined. Scripture contradicts that. God did not predetermine anybody. He's given us all salvation. He's given us all an opportunity. Now, jumping back forward into predestined, because there's some areas where, again, we have some sections in Scripture where they take the term predestined and they imply the meaning or they read the meaning into Scripture, and really it it perverts what Scripture is saying. Because you're, th you're taking a theological term and you're applying it to Scripture. Theology should never dictate how we understand Scripture. Theology should come from Scripture. You know, actually, I was just talking earlier, you know, with the concept of dispensations. I am not a dispensationalist. That's a theological system. But I do believe in dispensations because I take Scripture literally. And scripture is very clear that there's seven dispensations. There's not all these hyper dispensations and stuff. There's seven because I take it literally. I don't let my theology interpret scripture. It's the other way around. And we got to be very cautious about that. So here in Romans chapter 8 and verse 29, this is another passage that's used to say, oh, well, you know, God pre-chose who he would save, pre-elected. For whom he foreknew, he predestined. But if you take the word predestined out and you translate it correctly, I think you'll, you'll get a much clearer understanding of this passage. For whom he foreknew, he marked off the bounds to be conformed to the image of his son. Remember, over in Ephesians, God determined beforehand that he would take a group of people, place them into Christ, and they would be marked off. That's what it's talking about. He marked us off, which means, and I might get ahead of myself a little bit, but it means that we as Christians are not under law. We cannot be under law because our boundaries have been marked off to be sons. And sons don't need law. And then, of course, it's not, it, it is plural here. It's talking about being in Christ. Again, it's not you individually, by the way. For whom he foreknew is not you individually. It's those who would be in Christ. It's plural again. It's not singular. But in order to actually bring in a wrong concept to say you're pre elect, you have to make this singular. You can't do that with scripture, plural. It's y'all. You know, unfortunately, with some of our modern English, uh, especially the way we use modern English, we kind of lost some of the distinctions when we dropped the ye. And I know it sounds really funny, but ye is the plural of you. Now we just use you both ways, um, which we really should. Well, depending on where you're at, some people will say y'all or all of you. And you get that distinction. But otherwise, we don't get, and we, we can take it one way or the other, not really understanding what Scripture is saying. Scripture is saying this is plural. It's not you individually. All of those who, now, did God foreknow? Ephesians said God made a plan beforehand to mark off certain people, a certain group of people. It doesn't say individuals, because, again, there's passages that would contradict that. We are to be conformed to the image of his Son. Are those under law conformed to the image of, the, of his son? That was never mentioned under law. What about before law? Well, there were saints before law. Never mentioned. What about in the millennial kingdom? 
that is not actually a standard. The millennial kingdom is what's coming next. That's the next dispensation. Okay, That's after the tribulation period. We of the church are marked off to be conformed to the image of his son. When we see Christ, what are we going to be like? Him. It doesn't say we're going to be like other resurrected saints. It says we're going to be like him. Because our bounds are marked off. Okay. Calling of those who are marked off in verse 30. Moreover, whom he marked off, because it's not predestined, who he marked off, those he also called. And those whom he called, then it's he justified. Now you see in time what's going on. In time, he calls us. Uh, did I put the passage here? Um, I did. Um, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 10. This is another passage that's really important to understand. First Peter, or 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 10 says, Therefore, brethren, well, I'm going to read it out of the New, out of the New King James first. And then I'm going to fix a few things because they really cause a lot of confusion in the way they do this. Okay, therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your uh, call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. Now, that kind of sounds like we have to do something to ensure that our calling and election are actually secured. But that's not what the original is saying. As a matter of fact, the word sure here is not, I mean, the way it makes it sound, it's like sure is an action. We have to do something to make it make it sure. But sure is actually an adjective, which means it's modifying a noun. It, 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 it's not an action. And if you take it as modifying a noun, which noun is it modifying? It's modifying the word call. You're sure call even election now i can get really technical in here and, and in some cases i think some uh, christians really need to understand this and it does take a little bit of of getting a bit technical in the original language to properly understand this passage because we have a particular form here the call and the election now in english they drop the article because it doesn't make sense. Okay. So if we actually read it in English, it would say, you're the call and election, sure. That's really bad English. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. But in the Greek, it's done that way on purpose. Because there's only one of them that has an article, call. Which means call and election are referring to the same period of time. They relate to each other. So it's your call, even election, which means when you're called, that's when you're elect. Okay. Now, this is actually what Scripture is saying. It is not saying you make sure. It's saying you do, because this is your word do. It's not like I'm, I have to ensure I've got something. It's saying do it. Do your sure call, even election. Is our calling sure? Is it secure? Absolutely. It says do it. Apply it. Um, by the way, this is not an unknown issue in some of our translations that really cause some problems. Um, and I would encourage, you know, that if you have an opportunity, even if you don't understand the Greek, Get at least an interlinear to understand it. So you have the Greek there because you can start to see some of the um, important aspects of, of how scripture is actually translated and where there's some issues. Because I'm going to go back to another passage here over at the beginning of 1 Peter, where they're going to deal, they're going to actually move a word to justify theology. To actually move a word. Now, not all of our not of all, all of our English translations do this. By the way, King James does this. Uh, the New King James does this. First Peter chapter one and verse one. It says, "Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontius, 
Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God. The problem with that is the word elect is being moved from in front of pilgrim. It actually says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the elect pilgrims of the dispersion. You cannot take that word elect and shove it down past where they were dispersed to so that you can justify foreknowledge. Because they'll come here and say, well, it's we're elect according to the foreknowledge of God. No, that's not what this passage is saying. This is saying you were dispersed according to the foreknowledge of God. In other words, God wasn't surprised that the church was dispersed. He knew you guys were going to be dispersed here. But he's talking to the elect pilgrims. Okay. So it's important to keep with Scripture. And, and of course, understand your trans, where you actually have your, uh, in your linear, in how the interlinear, try to get that one out. Because um, like I said, that's really important to understand. We're not pre-elect. We all have opportunity to be saved. When God gives you an opportunity, share the gospel. But more than sharing the gospel, share the life you have in Christ. So you have an opportunity to actually share the gospel. You don't need to stand on the street corner telling people that they're going to go to hell. Most people kind of already know that. And the people who don't or who want to ignore that are going to get very upset about that. Now, in some cases, there's some people that they have a gift where they can actually just talk to a stranger about Christ, and the person believes. Seems like most of us, you know, people who don't have that gift, uh, you know, not so good at it. So how do we evangelize? How do we share? Since there's nobody specifically elect, everybody has an opportunity. You live out the life you have in Christ. Because then what happens? Peter talks about that. Always be ready to give a defense for the hope that you have. Well, how am I going to give a defense? Why would I give a defense? People are going to notice I live differently. I don't get involved with the things I get involved with. And they're going to ask you, why? why? And there's a perfect opportunity to share the gospel. It's, quite, it, it's a natural opportunity. You know, we should be focused on living out who we are in Christ because we're not, again, we're not pre, we're, nobody is pre-marked off to salvation. That's not what scripture says. Back over in Romans chapter 8 and verse uh, 30, when he says, whom those whom he marked off, those he also called, he's talking about in time. God determined he was going to do this, and now we're actually seeing it happen. You know, a good example of this is when did Christ come? Talks about at the end of the times. Not at the beginning, but at the appropriate time that God determined Christ would come. But it's down the road a bit, you know, uh, quite a bit. As a matter of fact, one of the aspects of propitiation involves the righteousness of God. Now, why does, why does there need to be a satisfaction for God's righteousness? Because what was he doing to sins previously committed? He was deferring punishment. How can a righteous being defer punishment on an unrighteous being? The blood of Christ shows why. Because he made a propitiation for sin. So the spirit beings that are looking at that are like, now I understand he is actually righteous. He absolutely is righteous in time. Okay, God determined he was going to do something. Now he's going to fulfill it, but not pre-select in time. So like I said, um, marking off the bounds involves, uh, <clears throat> we have specific bounds that Christ is, uh, that God has set on us. First uh, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 11, in him also we have obtained an inheritance being marked off again that's not predestined marked off before marked off according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the determination of his desire as well we have bule and thelomai in in the same word there or same sentence there uh counsel is your word determinate will and then just the word that they translate as will is your desire as well he has desires and he has determinations. What he is determined to do will happen. 
what he's desired to do, he would like to happen, but it's not necessary. This is why we as Christians are to learn the desirous will of God for our lives. He wants us to do it. It would be a lot better for us to do it, but he's not going to demand that we actually do it. Now, like I said, this word horizon, this is where this word comes from, horizon. Uh, Luke chapter 22 and verse 22 talks about this. And truly the Son of Man goes as he has determined where he was marked off. But woe to the man who betrays him. Was the Son of Man determined, was his, was his boundaries marked off? Didn't Jesus say to a Gentile woman, I'm not here for you? He did. But I'm not here for you. I'm here for the children, the sons of Israel. Now, she's the one who says, yeah, but even the dogs get to eat from the crumbs. Because she understood this, this is God in the flesh. This is the one that was promised. And God healed her. But you see his bounds. He was marked off. He came for Israel. Now, the next time he comes, he's going to ask, and the Father is going to give him the nations as his inheritance, and he is going to crush the nations and set up a righteous rule. Totally different boundaries. Okay. Uh, we also see uh, this, a specific day being set, Hebrews chapter 7 and verse, or 4 and verse 7. Again, he destined, <clears throat> this isn't your word destined, he marked, uh, this is your word horizon. He marked off a certain day, saying to David, today, after such a long time as it has been said, today I will hear his voice. Wasn't before then, it was today. It's marked off when, when that will actually happen. So marking off the bounds, like I said, that's setting the horizon. What was permitted to Christ over in uh, Ephesians or Acts chapter 4 and verse 28 was marked off. Now, again, this was marked off according to the determinate will of God. And like I said, we are actually marked off according to his purpose. This is over in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 11, which we've been through. Uh, we have another example here of being uh, boundaries over in Acts chapter 17 and verse 26. And it says, and he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has marked off their appointed times and boundaries. It doesn't say predetermined. It says marked off. When they would be and where, you know. Now, I know that kind of sounds like predestined, but predestined implies that your destiny has already been pre-chosen for you. And that's not what this word is actually describing. What this word is describing is the nations at their times, he's the one who set the boundaries around them. Okay. These are their boundaries. We are marked off, by the way, to the placement of sons. This is our boundaries. We as Christians are sons. What does that mean? Scripture uses the word son and children, and they have a different meaning. A children, child, actually literally means one who is born of. Did you know that we as Christians are not actually adopted? I'm going to deal with adoption here shortly, because that word doesn't, that doesn't actually show up in Scripture either. Oh, I did. I did, by the way, hunt down the actual Greek words for the word adoption because they don't occur in Scripture because we're not adopted. We're actually legitimate children of God. God's seed is placed in us. But we're not talking about being a child. We're talking about one who's placed as a son. Okay, this word son, and like I said, this it's this word here where they translate the adoption. Now, in the New King James, it's almost kind of funny because they say the adoption of sons, which um, if you understand the Greek, it's kind of silly because they put the word sons in there, but the word adoption literally means to place or set. It doesn't mean adopt. Um, now, like I said, for those of you who have the notes, you have actually the Greek, the original Greek word for adoption, because they did have a word that meant adoption. It doesn't occur in scripture. And I did put in the pre-Koine Greek word for adoption. Uh, but again, that word does not occur in Scripture. We're not adopted. We 
are placed into a position of maturity. Let's jump over into Galatians. Okay. In Galatians is where we begin to understand the distinction between a child and a son. Okay. In Galatians chapter 4 and verse 1, it says, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, now this particular word child here, it, it is your word napios. It is not your normal word for like a baby or a small one. This is a particular word that, that is describing a time in human life where we speak, but we don't speak anything that makes any sense. Okay, this is when the baby's talking, but they're they're not putting things together. They, they're gibberish. Now, it's interesting in, in uh, the original Greek, in Roman culture, they actually use this same term to describe somebody of any age who is really, what they're saying doesn't make any sense. They don't understand what they're talking about. They'll call them a napios. You're just being a child. You're being an inarticulate babbler. You know, and we run across that all the time. You know, we'll run across people who maybe in our trade and stuff like that, you know, on on my other side, shall I say, I, I do computers and stuff like that. And I'll run into people who are systems administrator and stuff, and they want to talk, you know, like they, they know everything. And you're sitting there going, you don't understand anything that you're talking about. You just grabbed a few terms and you're using them, but you're using them completely incorrectly. Okay, that's what it's talking about here. See, a child under the Roman culture, when a child was born into the family, the, uh, the master, the father, would put that child under certain servants to be trained. Now, being put under certain servants, if the father really cared about the child, he would give the servant authority over the child. That is the law. The law is like that servant who rules. Okay. You do this at this time. You get up at this time. You come to this lesson at this time. You learn this information. We're going to apply this information. I don't care if you want to go play with your friends. Not that time. This is what the law does. This is exactly the, the culture in the Roman culture being used in a concept for us as Christians. Because Israel was treated as a child, we are treated as sons. But it goes on. Now I say, the heir, as long as he is an inarticulate babbler, does not differ at all from the slave, though he is master of all. But he is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father. Until. And when he is appointed he is now above the stewards and the governors but he's also at this point to be trained to understand how to properly manage the household he's had all the training he needs to be able to be a master of the household where the household's going to be productive now if you put him in while he was an inarticulate babbler he wouldn't do so well he would he would squander the wealth of the of the family Okay, that's what is, there's a big distinction here. This, by the way, is why we as Christians cannot be under law. We're not children. We're not to be inarticulate babblers. We are to be, well, this word inarticulate babblers is a very interesting word in the way scripture actually uses it. Um, because there's several different occurrences of this where oftentimes you think of it as a child, but uh, when you look at it in the context, um, it, it really helps you to, to comprehend the fact that we as Christians are not to be ones who are inarticulate babblers, especially Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 13, where we are supposed to train our senses to discern the difference between what is proper and what is improper for us. That's us as Christians. Okay. I would actually encourage you to do a quick study if you've got an opportunity on the word, um, the, the Greek word, napios. Typically, they'll translate it as babe. And you'll see it's not talking about little babies. 
It's talking about people who don't articulate what they actually believe. They can't articulate it because they haven't learned. Uh, there's some very good passages in this. So that where our bounds are marked off to be ones who are sons. We are the saints of grace. Grace is God's attitude whereby he gives a benefit without consideration of merit. I was talking about that earlier. Don't miss, really, it's not that the trend, that the uh, interpretation unmerited favor is entirely bad when it comes to grace. I think it just leaves out an element of grace that's kind of important. Because, and it also leaves out the, uh, leaves a door open where somebody could imply, well, if I could earn it, then I don't need God's grace. Because it's unmerited favor. But it's not unmerited favor. It doesn't care whether you can marry it or not, which means even if I work for it, I can't earn it. He's not looking at my work. My salvation's by grace. God decided to give it to me. We are the ones who are justified by grace. Romans chapter uh, 3 and verse 24 talks about that. We are justified out from faith. We're not justified by works. I'm going to have to jump here. Uh, grace cannot be mixed with wor with works. This is over in Romans chapter 4 and verse 4. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. Debt. If I work for it, then I earn it. Can't earn salvation. Salvation is offered freely. Um, and it, scripture also talks about the fact that we have access to this faith through grace, not through works. Romans chapter 5 and verse 2 talks about that. It's through grace. Grace is through Christ, Romans chapter 5 and verse 15. Um, grace, by the way, also counters the sin nature, which Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 21, they are incredible. That's an incredible passage to understand because Adam brought sin into the world. Adam, through Adam, we are uh, we, the trespass brought spiritual death, where Christ counters that completely. Through grace. Amen. We are to show forth, because our bounds are marked off, we are to show forth who we are in Christ. That's where our bounds are marked off. So we are, um, I want to jump back over into Ephesians here, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 1, where it says, Having marked off, now we're going to translate it correctly. Having marked off our bounds to the placement of sons through Jesus Christ is the, the agent by which this happens, through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasures of his desirous will. We're marked off to be sons. Not under law. Not in articulate babblers. Ones who mature, ones who understand how to the distinction between good and evil, and how to apply it to our lives, because we're in Christ. That's all this election stuff. That's what he's talking about, and pretty incredible when we understand it. So, 